Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the webinar, State of Donations. My name is Paul Wong and I'm from ANS, Nectar and RDS and depends on the order of ANS, Nectar and RDS, I could be coming from NRA. Uh, with me today is uh, my colleague Susanna and uh, we have a number of uh, speakers for um, today. Today we have three panel members, Simon Huggins, Chair of the Australian Orchid Advisory Group, uh, Melroy, Melroy Technical Support Analyst uh, from the Australian uh, Access Federations, uh, also the Australian Consortium Lead, and uh, Dr. Laurie Hart from uh, uh, Orchid Executive Directors. So I'm just going to pass control to Melroy, who will be showing you a short um, video first. ORCID, the open researcher and contributor ID, is changing the way researchers connect to their works around the globe. The ORCID Consortium is a community of Australian organisations that takes a national approach to ORCID adoption and integration. By joining the Australian Consortium, your organisation can become a part of the national ORCID community. The Australian ORCID Consortium maximises the benefits for organisations providing a premium membership, discounted fees, access to local support and a range of resources. Being part of the consortium is being part of the national community. Whether you're integrating ORCID with your systems or working with researchers to maintain their records, the Australian ORCID Consortium has the resources and support you need. To find out more about how to become a part of the Australian ORCID Consortium, visit aaf.edu.au and search ORCID. Thanks, Melroy, um, and thanks, Paul. So my name's Simon Huggard. I'm the uh, chair of the ORCID advisory uh, group. And so what I'm going to do is cover a few things uh, today about the governance of the ORCID consortium and what that means, and um, talk a bit about the, the work that the consortium does and, and resources, and then I'll pass over to Melroy, who'll talk a bit more, in, in a bit more detail about what the AAF provide as part of the uh, consortium lead. So the Orchid, Australian Orchid Consortium uh, was launched in January 2016. So it's been around for some time, and it was formed originally from uh, out, of, out of some working groups that came out of uh, some e-research conferences before that time, uh, led by ANS, there was some discussion uh, around what ORCID was and uh, how the Australian community could improve take up of ORCIDs to um, you know, help researchers identify uh, their publications and uh, their research outputs and gain credit for the work that they do in their research. So. Um, the, the consortium has been around for a while. Uh, it, it consists, as you can see on the graphic there, of uh, 40 members. So we have 37 uh, universities, higher education institutions in Australia who are members. Uh, we have the two funders, the ARC and NHMRC, that are members of the organisation. And uh, we also have CSIRO as the research institution um, shown there on the graphic. And so the consortium uh, is uh, run, so we have a, a governance committee and I'll cover what that means, but the uh, consortium lead is the Australian Access Federation. So that's where the technical resources are and infrastructure available to help people to ensure that uh, the ORCID infrastructure works well within their own organisation and they provide technical people and resources in order to do that. So who can be uh, consortium members? So uh, membership comes from those range of organisations that I mentioned before. So higher education institutions, uh, not-for-profit organisations, and government research institutes and funding agencies. So the, the consortium itself is a not-for-profit uh, organisation. So uh, the, the same types of institutions are, are members within the organisation so that we can help each other work towards ensuring that uh, ORCID has a strong take up in our research community in Australia. So um, this is why uh, you know those organisations, not vendors, not publishers, are part of that consortium because it's about our own organisations enabling uh, that, uh, that work to, to fund 
uh, implementation within our institutions to uh, be advocates for the for ORCID and to be able to enable that take up uh, across the Australian community. Now, membership does cost money, so um, the consortium membership uh, there's fees for uh, to pay for your ORCID membership and there's a fee to become part of the consortium which pays for those technical resources and help that are provided in order to uh, do that integration and work uh, with each institution in order for them to ensure they have good take up of, of ORCID within their infrastructure. So the uh, this is a diagram showing the um, the governance structure around ORCID and uh, what we've set up. So the consortium works uh, nationally and internationally to uh, to sustain um, the ORCID community and make sure that we are implementing best practice and best advice around how to uh, ensure uh, ORCIDs are taken up properly by the, the community and uh, working well within the international um, the global infrastructure, I guess, to make sure that, that uh, everything is connected and works well uh, across different organisations. Um, so we have the ORCID Advisory Group, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, we have the Consortium Lead, which is the Australian Access uh, Federation. And then we have the ORCID uh, Consortium Governance Committee overseeing uh, the work of, of, uh, that's done within our community here. And there's um, also connections with the International ORCID Board, um, of which uh, Laurie Hark is a member and she'll talk about how that fits in with what our, in our infrastructure is doing and how our organisation fits with that. Uh, we, within Australia, we're uh, fortunate at the moment in that uh, Linda O'Brien, um, Pro Vice-Chancellor at Griffith University, is on the International ORCID Board. So she uh, has been very valuable uh, to be able to provide advice uh, to, to the international community about um, how our governance works and how our uh, take-up of ORCID has worked within this country and around our, our consortium and providing uh, really good input into uh, how that should work on a national, on a global scale and, um, and working towards common goals to make sure that um, take-up and uh, resources and you know a good way of operating and how we talk about ORCID and what it means in terms of our communities will work well uh, on an international scale. So the Australian ORCID Advisory Group um, is a part of the, uh, is, it provides advice to the, the uh, consortium. So the, the, um, the Governance Committee uh, it oversees what the uh, ORCID Advisory Group does. So um, the Governance Committee acts as a key vehicle in, in guiding decision making uh, for the consortium in Australia uh, to make sure that it can operate uh, effectively and sustainably into the future. Uh, we have representatives from, fed, uh, from a number of peak bodies in Australia to, um, who are part of that governance, that, uh, governance committee. The, if, you, if you want to know who the people are who are on that governance committee, it's on our um, AAF ORCID webpage and at the end of this uh, presentation there'll be links to where that information sits. And on that web page, there's a, an, uh, a page covering uh, governance of the ORCID Advisory Group, the ORCID uh, Governance Committee, and who those members are. And so I'm uh, chair of the Australian ORCID Advisory Group. Um, the, the membership of that group initially uh, came from members of the working party that was set up a few years ago to look at how we would implement ORCID within Australia and what was the best practice that we could uh, do to set that up. But the, the, the committee structure has changed a little bit, uh, or the committee membership has changed a little bit in the past uh, couple of years. And we've uh, tried to get as many people as we can on that, on that uh, advisory group to uh, ensure that we have proper, you know, diverse representation from around the community. So we have people um, from uh, the AAF itself, from ANS, uh, from the ARC and NHMRC. We have representatives from CORDIT um, and from CALL, uh, and as well as uh, representatives who cover some of the uh, research institutes so that we get a sense of, uh, a, you know, a real wide uh, representation across the community. And the 
advisory group uh, which I chair, uh, we meet um, we uh, meet quarterly uh, via Zoom, and we uh, you know we provide uh, advice on strategy and direction for Orchid for uh, the take up within Australia and what we should be doing in terms of strategies around uh, advocacy for Orchid. Now, what that looks like from our own institutions' points of view and from people we talk to and uh, and from some of the membership that we have on other committees and groups uh, within and outside of our organisation so that we provide uh, good advice to the, the consortium lead as to how what the strategies are, where they should be putting their efforts in terms of um, providing support to the, the community in Australia. Um, and so I, I'm also being chair of the advisory group. Uh, I have representation on the governance committee, which meets uh, once per year. And so then, then we, we talk there about uh, the overall directions for ORCID uh, within Australia. And so some of the things that we've talked about are, uh, you know, what is our vision? What are, we, what are our end goals here? What are we trying to achieve? So we've um, published a, a statement on the Australian ORCID website around Vision 2020, which are our aspirations for ORCID and what that means. And uh, what we are trying to do, as you can see uh, from the slide there, is really improve the take up of ORCID within our institutions and um, make that a lot easier for, for our institutions to have the right infrastructure and the right people to be able to take that up and reduce the barriers to actually uh, uh, taking up ORCID and what strategies um, each institution should do to, you know, to achieve that, that vision. And we see um, a number of different bodies as being really important in that vision. Uh, so it's, uh, it's about our own institutions and what they can do. It's about the governance of our own institutions. It's around uh, funding bodies and what they can do to help achieve those goals um, and government agents uh, themselves, as well as the, you know, our own researchers and our own uh, institutional members and uh, you know, being able to work towards uh, a common goal, hopefully by 2020, but you never know. We'll see uh, how long that takes to actually improve, you know, how we can actually uh, improve that take up across our institutions. And what we've done is we've developed, um, so the consortium lead, the AAF have, have developed a few stories here around uh, what does that look like from each person's point of view, depending on what, uh, where you sit, whether you're a funding body, whether you're a researcher who's applying for a grant from a funding body, uh, whether you're from an institution where you're uh, trying to improve your research profile and promote your research, um, or you're an early career researcher who uh, is just wanting to publish for the first time, and where does ORCID fit within those stories and what, what benefit does it provide for each of those uh, scenarios, those stories. So we've published uh, these resources on the Australian ORCID website uh, to help, possibly help you, help institutions who are wondering what ORCID's about and what it means, um, to help you be an advocate for ORCID and why each institution put, should be uh, engaging with that and what it means for your organisation. So I would recommend that you, uh, that participants here go and look at those stories because they are very useful and they can be used for presentations or information sessions that you might be running or putting on your website around ORCID and why uh, it's important for people to, to use their ORCID ID. Uh, I just want to briefly cover some uh, statistics. So. Since the start of the ORCID consortium in 2016, these are the kind of numbers we're seeing. So the figure on the left of 116,000 odd affiliations um, in the ORCID registry is the number of uh, times that an Australian affiliation is mentioned in someone's uh, ORCID uh, profile. So uh, it's a large number. This is where somebody may be, it may be counted a few times. So um, because someone might, an individual who has an ORCID ID might have an affiliation with three different institutions. So in fact, that uh, that may be counted three times in those numbers. Um, and then the figure on the right uh, indicates how many uh, ORCID IDs have an, uh, you know, an Australian uh, listed affiliation themselves, where it looks like that person is coming from an Australian institution. So our numbers of 27,000 for for us nationally are, are pretty good, but there I still think there's uh, an, you know quite a bit of work to do 
around those, um, ensuring that that information is kept up to date in people's or in the ORCID registry um, and populating those uh, ORCID profiles with information from, you know, about people's research and about what they're doing. Uh, there's still, you know, a, a fair way to go. And I think when we look at um, our higher degree by research students, our P PhD students and our early career researchers, they may also, uh, you know, there's probably quite a bit of work to ensure that people are, have an ORCID ID and are using it in appropriate places uh, to help them promote their own research and save them time in providing the same information over and over. So now I'm going to uh, pass on to Melroy, who's going to tell us a bit more about the role of uh, the AAF as consortium lead and what they do. Thank you for that, Simon. All right, as consortium lead, uh, AAF has a number of responsibilities. Uh, the first one among them is technical support. So what AAF does is we provide tier one technical support to our consortium members. And we also escalate tier two support incidents to the ORCID support team. Uh, we also provide all our consortium members with unlimited one-on-one -on -one consultations to discuss their ORCID integrations, as well as provide advice and guidance with regards to communication and outreach, which is good because the next point I was going to raise was outreach and communication. So what we do with regards to outreach and communication is participate in various webinars organized by other research partners to spread the ORCID message. We try and organize events to do so. We also participate in events and conferences that are related to research to promote the use of ORCID. And then we communicate with all our consortium members through various communication channels like newsletters, community forum posts, emails, etc. Then uh, with regards to strategy, uh, we liaise with our consortium members as well as ORCID itself to ensure that our members' interests are represented and we can provide feedback to ORCID via appropriate channels. We also participate in various ORCID working groups to understand how ORCID is used internationally as well as provide feedback and recommendations not only to our consortium members but also to ORCID about what's happening within Australia. And then we liaise with other consortia leads around the world to discuss with best practices currently following, being followed by them and what they are doing with regards to ORCID. And then there's uh, the administration part, which involves renewal of licensing agreement every year with ORCID and the consortium members, along with management of invoicing, billing, as well as membership. We also look at uh, managing and onboarding new members, providing them with the right resources and tools to start off with their integration. Now, with regards to a consortium member integrations, we've, have, we've had 29 members who've done around 32 integrations between themselves, which are uh, where some members have integrated more than one system with ORCID. Based on uh, the graph, about it's it's almost a 40 60 mix between custom integrations and vendor integrations now custom integrations are those integrations where universities have developed their own application to interface with the orchid registry whereas vendor systems are vendor based integrations in that institutions who already have a vendor based system in place have just used their orchid integration inbuilt orchid integration to interact with orchid Another thing about integrations is the collect and connect badges, and it is a program that ORCID have developed. It's an initiative that the consortium lead is going to be targeting at consortium members who've done their ORCID integration, because the idea behind collect and connect is to streamline the integration process, as well as foster a shared user experience. What we expect researchers to do or what researchers would be doing is as and when they keep moving universities, they would be using their ORCID ID in different institutions. And the idea is to provide them with the same sort of user experience they get so that it, so that it helps them understand what ORCID is, how to engage with it and keep that always uniform. So with the collect and connect, there are four different badges. We have the collect badge, which effectively is what you would get 
if you are collecting orchid ids using an integration where you've authenticated where you get researchers to authenticate themselves to the orchid registry then there is display which is a badge that you would get if you are displaying the collected orchid ids connect is a badge that's generally given to institutions who have demonstrated the fact that they can connect their system to the orchid registry as well as upload things from their orchid from their system to the to their researchers orchid profile whereas sync badges are awarded are awarded to universities who are able to synchronize their systems with orchid which means if there's a change in the researchers orchid profile that's automatically reflect, reflected in their institutional system and vice versa in the next month uh, aaf will start communicating with members to try and get them to apply for their collect and connect badges where possible community forum so another initiative that uh, the consortium has started is a community forum for consortium members to interact with each other and establish a community of practice so why exactly do we want a community forum well we did send a we did send a survey out in 2016 to consortium members and there was a very strong request to have a community forum where members could interact with each other talk to each other and find out what's happening with orchid in australia what we've done is we've taken a national approach and for it to be successful members need to collaborate with each other and not reinvent the wheel also the community forum does provide members with a voice as orchid community support also monitor the forum now who can join the forum any researcher or staff of a consortium member can join the community forum and any questions you have regarding joining the forum please send an email to support at af.edu.au and we would love to help you out with it and how do you join the easiest way to join is to go to community.orchid.org and register or sign up with your institutional email address if you do not already have an account once you're signed in you will automatically be redirected to the australian orchid community forum space where you can start posting or collaborating with your peers so the consortium also does a lot of work internationally and interact with our consortia with the other international consortia and what we do is we try and exchange information with them on best practices for ORCID implementation, as well as what we've been doing with community engagement and what they've been doing with community engagement, trying to find that out. We, the consortium leads also an active part of a few ORCID working groups and helping represent the consortium members' interests in them. And AF as a consortium lead also participated in the first International ORCID Consortia Workshop held in Lisbon earlier in 2018. So these are some of the resources that will be available at the end of the slide. And now I'll just change presenters and pass it on to Laurie Hark, who is from ORCID. All right, so thank you. I think I have six minutes. I'm gonna to try to go through this fairly quickly. Um, so first thing I just wanted to mention um, about ORCID in Australia. All of the hard work of Melroy and Simon and Paul and Natasha is paying off. Um, we had our first uh, ORCID consortium meeting in January this year, um, and we brought together all of our existing consortia <clears throat> and a number of countries uh, sent representatives who are um, in the process of considering uh, creating consortia. And um, among the awardees you can see over here is Melroy, his splendid hat, and Elena. Um, on behalf of AAF, we provided them um, one of our first ORCID consortium awards. Um, and you can see here um, information from our blog post about this. But yes, you guys uh, in Australia, the Australians and the consortia has been just really superb at building community, um, your patience in building the sector and building um, in building, uh, I guess, a consensus and a policy across the sector, not just on ORCID, but really on research information and the relevance of persistent identifiers for that um, has really been, uh, it's notable. So yeah, we provided this um, award just to recognize the work of 
uh, the ORCID Consortium, as well as very specifically uh, Melroy and Elena. And thank you very much, uh, not just for doing a great job in Australia, but also for being, as it says here, very generous in sharing your experiences with, um, with other consortia. Um, so what you've done in Australia has been noticed and replicated several times over in other countries around the world. So I just want to say thank you again and acknowledge the hard work um, and effective work that has been going on. Um, in terms of around the world, uh, we now have um, nearly 5 million registered researchers. We should hit that mark sometime this summer. Um, and we have 854 ORCID member organizations now in 44 countries, including 17 national consortia. And we should have something close to 20 to 25 consortia by the end of this year. Um, so there will be a little bit more green on the map at that point. Um, you all know the ORCID vision. It's not just about providing identifiers for researchers, but really for enabling connections between researchers and uh, their contributions across disciplines, borders, and time. And it's really wonderful to see the work um, of Australia and the kind of, I guess, leverage that the consortia has had to encourage uh, service providers, vendors, and platform providers to integrate ORCID and identifiers into their systems so that you can use these things and actually create these connections. Um, in the past year, um, we have worked very hard with our board, uh, which does include a member of um, the ORCID uh, consortium in, um, in Australia. Um, and we worked with our board and the extended community to create a roadmap for the next three years um, and developed some uh, statements on core strategies. And uh, we have developed a plan, as mentioned, for the next three years, where each year uh, we focus on a specific sector um, and enact those core strategies for those sectors. So last year, our focus was on research institutions. Um, we continue to work with research institutions, but this year our main focus is on funders. Um, next year, 2019, our main focus will be on uh, bringing to bear everything that we've learned and developed with research institutions and funders and previously with uh, with publishing sector um, to bring that to bear on uh, returning the benefits to the researchers. That will be 2019. Um, so I'm just going to go very quickly through the core strategies. Um, and then if I have a little bit of time to talk about some of the projects we're working on. All of this is available on our website, um, the about what is ORCID, or you can look up ORCID core strategies in any browser and get to this page. So we have four core strategies. The first and main one is positioning researchers at the center of everything that we do. Um, the second one focuses on infrastructure and making sure that we develop a robust information infrastructure. And I will never forget uh, standing at the ORCID launch in Australia and having the then head of the ARC say, you know what, if we're going to use this, we have to be have to be ensured that the ORCID infrastructure is reliable. And, you know, that's, yep, you're right. We have to make sure this is available during the last crunch um, to uh, uh, submitting grants, for example. We have to make sure it's available. Um, so that's uh, a major, major focus of ours. Uh, the, the third core strategy is trusted assertions. So not just enabling um, ORCID ID to other identifier connections, but also to ensure that the community has trust or at least understanding of who made that connection and when, um, and also can trust that those connections are traceable so that somebody can click and navigate to the source document or the source connector. Uh, and the fourth, fourth core strategy is strategic relationships. Um, so we are um, in the process of developing um, a very strong partners network. Um, and then uh, we really see our sustainability through those strategic relationships. And a big part of that is um, our consortia and ensuring that we have strong relationships with consortia and that each consortia, as um, happens in Australia, has a very strong leadership component that is supported by uh, the local community. So as I mentioned, I'm really, really pleased with um, the example that Australia has set for the rest of the world. Um, in each of these core strategies, we have specific projects. I don't think I really have a lot of time to go through this, um, but for researchers um, looking at, you know, enabling them to share information through using their identifier, 
We're spending a, a big chunk of time this year collecting evidence, and this is a project that dovetails with work that AAF are doing. Um, we've added new affiliation categories. We've been uh, have been uh, supporting employment and education, and we've added qualifications to education as well as invited positions, distinctions, membership, and service. And this is available very, very soon. It says end of April. I think it was pushed off by a week. Um, but if you're a developer, you can play around with this uh, API 3.0 in the sandbox and we'll have these additional affiliations in there. Um, we've done a lot of work on research resources and I know Syro has been interested in this. And we are going to be adding a new section to the ORCID record to store information and connections between researchers and the resources that they use to do their research. Um, and uh, there is an example of uh, what this looks like in the ORCID record. This is already being used by Oak Ridge um, and uh, PNNL, which is Pacific Northwest National Laboratory here in the United States. And there are a number of other organizations working on this. Um, as I mentioned, we're doing a collecting the evidence, uh, demonstrating the benefit of ORCID both from the perspective of the researcher as well as organizations. We have been uh, launched a project called Orbit, where um, this is very much focused on bringing funders together. This now includes 13 funding bodies from 11 countries, including the ARC um, and other uh, funders in the region, including the Japan uh, Science and Technology uh, Foundation um, and MB in New Zealand. Um, we are working on trusted assertion. So what does an assertion mean? Um, and a whole host of policies around that, which you will see more about, as well as uh, compliance with GDPR, the European Data Transfer Regulation. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the strategic relationships, the uh, regional strategies, uh, both internally um, enhancing our infrastructure, um, making sure that our consortia um, are able to support the local community. We're looking at member models for very small organizations. And I mentioned the partners program. So that's it for me. All right, there you go, Paul. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present. And I'll give this back to Paul. I, I won't uh, show my screen, there's no point. So what I'm going to do is to perhaps just open up the floor for questions and, and Q&A. Uh, we've got about uh, 15, 20 minutes. So if anyone in the audience have burning questions, uh, please use the chat box. And can I mention, Paul, that, that we um, are planning on having an ORCID roundtable meeting in Canberra around about the 5th of September. Uh, later in the year to uh, bring together uh, stakeholders and uh, anyone who's interested to be able to, to ask questions and to look at where our development uh, is going and um, I guess including people like funders and publishers who may not have too much of an opportunity to talk about ORCID and how they improve uh, their take up and what that means for them. Uh, so that's in, in September in Canberra. So there's an opportunity there for people to come along and actually talk to us face to face and uh, can participate in workshops there. Uh, I do have a, uh, a question that uh, uh, sounds more like a request. Any chance you, you can make current affiliation mandatory for researchers who sign up? It is so hard to tell if they are our people. I, I guess that's, that's a question for uh, Laurie. Yeah, so um, this was a big thrust last year and it continues to this year is to have uh, there be a, a connection made when a researcher registers um, that there is a connection also with their university so that the university can store the identifier in the university database, whichever or wherever that is designated, and then post back into the ORCID record the affiliation for that individual. Um, so there's actually a handshake between the individual and the university um, that allows the push and pull of information between ORCID and the university. Um, there are now, I think, close to 100, I think, universities that are doing this push and pull and putting um, organization information, employment or um, education into the ORCID record. Um, the benefit for the organization is exactly as you say, you know who your researchers are because you've collected their ID. You can 
effectively communicate um, that this researcher is one of yours. Um, the information that shows up on the ORCID record also has the source on it listed clearly, and the source can be that of the institution itself. Um, so it's also a benefit uh, for the institution as well as the researcher when they go now to publish a paper um, or submit a grant. Um, publishers and funders are starting to pull information from the ORCID record to help populate forms like manuscript submission or grant application systems. And that statement of affiliation, the organization name, its identifier, and the role of the individual can be easily uh, pulled into those uh, submission systems. So that's what we're trying to do is work with you, the institution, uh, to get that handshake happening and to have the institution actually put the affiliation information into the ORCID record. Long answer. Any thoughts from Simon or Melroy on the same uh, For me, with regards to an institution affiliation, the easiest and the best way to get that done is, as Laurie mentioned, for organizations when they set up their integration to be able to write that immediately to their researchers' ORCID profile. Uh, affiliation data is something that universities own, and they are the ones that can actually say whether a researcher is doing research work with them, is employed by them, whether a graduate student studies with them, if an academic staff's employed by them, they are the ones that have that data. So it's the easiest way to actually get affiliation information into somebody's ORCID record is for the universities itself to do it as part of the sign-up process when they get their researchers to sign in via the system. That's the best way to do it. It saves, and that way they can then keep track of which researchers are affiliated to their institution. Yeah, there is a piece uh, of this around uh, privacy and permission, that kind of thing. So it's uh, ORCID are very careful to ensure that, uh, you know, we ask researchers for their permission to do what we need to do. So there, there is a, a bit of a piece there around making sure that that permission is granted and then we can use that uh, as part of that assertion uh, information. So. Uh, there is a bit of work, uh, Laurie, in that in, in that regard, I guess, around permissions and ensuring that uh, researchers aren't asked 20,000 times for permission for different things, but also know what permission they're giving um, and at the right time, and that that's uh, it's sort of understood and well known. Well, that's part of the the assertions policy that we're working on this year is to clarify uh, or streamline some of that permissioning piece, um, and also to allow sharing of well, to get a little bit technical, to allow uh, uh, service providers um, access to um, member API credentials so there's a smoother flow of information. Um, the critical piece there is making sure that the researcher remains informed about who is handling their information and where it's ultimately being used. So, Okay, I've got uh, uh, any other questions here. I work with researchers that produce a lot of non-traditional outputs, uh, I guess those uh, in the creative arts and uh, humanities. I find records in ORCID are not always adequate to, to describe this work. Are there any plans to review or revise the options for these researchers? And again, I guess that, that's a question for Laurie. Right, so um, ORCID handles over 30 work types. Um, however, um, we have largely focused in the first few years on um, journals. Um, we have been increasingly engaging with uh, book publishers, um, but you're right, that doesn't cover the wide uh, range of contributions that a researcher or scholar can make. Um, so we're in, we continue to look for opportunities to work with uh, repositories, um, other, other uh, places where digital descriptions of works are stored uh, so that these connections between ORCID IDs and those works can be made. And so we're really um, eager to hear um, your ideas for where which repositories we can be interacting with. Um, and we would be happy to partner with um, you to uh, help 
to work and collaborate with those platforms um, to set up um, interactions where an individual can connect their identifier. Um, storing it in ORCID isn't, I don't think, would be too much of a challenge. The issue is how to get it in there. Um, and I'm really reluctant to ask a researcher to type stuff in the ORCID record that really kind of defeats the purpose of what we're trying to do. So help us understand where the information sources are, and uh, we're more than happy to work with you and those platforms to, to, to enable a connection. Another question is here in relation to the Orbit project. Uh, is it possible to have an update on the Orbit project and likely time that it might be used by funders like the ARC? Yeah, so ARC is part of the Orbit project. Uh, my understanding is the ARC has a timeline for um, ORCID integration into their systems. I think they've started. Uh, um, and so the uh, objective with Orbit is to get the funders to share with each other what their plans are. And I believe that the ARC is participating in one of the early pilots um, to actually demonstrate um, ORCID integration um, in their grant application system. And I think I'm kind of speaking out of turn here, but I think their plan was to have the integration online in 2019. Um, so, uh, but we'll be, uh, we are trying to do regular um, uh, uh, blog posts with the Orbit project. And as soon as we know more about the timing of various funder implementations, uh, we will communicate those through the Orbit blog. Is it common now for Orbit ID to auto populate a researcher's profile in their institutional research management system? I guess this is a general question for everyone. Yeah, so um, from a service provider perspective, it depends on uh, the kind of integration between uh, the research institution and ORCID. And there's different platform providers that have different methods. And um, we do see a general trend that uh, service providers can, um, let me think, pull information from ORCID into their platform, but not all service providers put information from the platform into ORCID or vice versa. So it, it really depends on um, the platform that the, the university or research institution is using. But certainly it is possible to go one or the other or both directions. Um, it's all of that is very technically possible and, and exists today. And I think it's really, Melroy, be interesting to hear from you kind of what the trend is in Australia given the various uh, service provider platforms that are used for um, exchanging information. With regards to exchanging information, what we've at least what we've been speaking with uh, librarians and those that are doing the community and outreach activities is that to get researchers when they sign up, if the integration, if it's not their repository that's actually being integrated with a researcher's ORCID profile so that they can push that data onto their ORCID profile, is to get the researchers to use the existing Crossref APIs the data site APIs, as well as use Scopus or researcher ID search and link visits within the ORCID, within the ORCID uh, website itself to be able to retrospectively add their papers. Having said that, most publishers we've spoken to are generally asking for ORCID IDs right now, and there have been a few instances where We've seen on Twitter that a researcher has actually published a paper and it hasn't yet come out in a publication, but because a DOI was minted for it and they had their ORCID ID associated with it, it's automatically populated into their ORCID records. So there has that 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 sort of stuff has been happening. It's yeah, it it is it is possible to have that happen automatically but there is also a level of work that needs to be done in the first instance in registering and getting it to do so because with ORCID the only way a researcher will have something added to their profile is if they explicitly give someone permission to do that you can't just add anything into their profile yeah, I could I could add to that that um, in the repository community in Australia, there's still quite a bit of work to uh, not only just have orchids available uh, within repositories, uh, but also displaying them on web page on the within the metadata that people can see, and then also populating the uh, repositories with uh, metadata about publications and that syncing 
so that collect and that, that connect and the syncing, there's still a lot of work to do uh, within the Australian repository community to make that happen. So quite a bit of work has been done uh, with the publication harvesting systems that people have, but the actual external facing repositories, there's still quite a bit of work to do. Yeah, what we found with some repositories is that there isn't always the concept of a person. Um, and so bringing in a person identifier, if there's no concept of a person, is uh, it's hard. <laughs> and so there's there's kind of a database refactoring aspect as well in some repository systems, but not all. So it's nice to see, for example, in the UK, just um, help to sponsor um, ePrints to develop a uh, module that actually allowed for the concept of a person, which then enables IDs um, for people to be stored and information to be exchanged more readily. So um, I think that'll probably, that kind of thing will probably be able to happen with other kinds of repo systems. Yeah. Yeah, the, the call, uh, the call uh, consortium last year, uh, I think it was last year, we did a survey of repository managers, which we do almost every year and yeah I think it was 39% of uh, repositories can display a you know an ORCID ID uh, they're actually doing that within their repositories so it's 39% so there's still a way to go. Okay I, also, I have another uh, semi-technical kind of questions. Do you need to be a consortium member to use the API to automatically pull in publications to a website? Do you want to take that Laurie or do you want me to take that? <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, so um, to automatically, to be notified, um, if you want to get automatic notifications from ORCID, um, that is a member API function. Uh, however, you can use the public API to query uh, the ORCID registry. Um, the public API only provides access to the, that information which a researcher has marked public. Uh, so there may be some items that are not accessible through the public API. So if you want updates uh, uh, provided, um, then you should become a member and you can receive those notifications. And I think the other piece there is that um, in many cases, updates you would like tied to the researchers that are at your institution. Um, and the way to know who those researchers are is to have them connect their ID into your system um, and give back the affiliation information so they can use it when they publish. Um, so um, yes, there's a lot you can do with the public API, but there's a lot more that you can do when you use the member API. So, Melroy, I don't know what you'd like to add. I oh, know that was almost the same thing. So, yeah, she yeah. just covered it all. Okay, uh, I think uh, I got uh, the last questions here. Uh, two questions, not the same, same questions, really. Uh, requests more than anything to uh, have um, a link to the um, those uh, use case user stories. It's uh, basically just off the AAF website, isn't it? Yes, yeah, it directly. is just, yeah. just off the AF website. And what I'll do is in the question and answer box, can I type that in? No. I think Paul will have to type that in to send it to everybody. Um, yeah, that's not a problem. problem. We'll, uh, I think the, the smart thing to do is, is that maybe uh, we'll follow up with uh, email notifications when the video is available and in that email I'll include a set of resources and, and yeah. links to the relevant sort of material. Yeah, it's the same thing with the slides. So in the slides right at the end where there were a couple there were a couple of slides with regards to resources, uh, the resource it, the link is over there. So it is definitely in one of those links. So no you problem. Click on I just copy and paste that. It'll take so you that, straight to that particular resource. Yeah, so that URL has been sent to everyone now. So I think uh, with that note, we have uh, pretty much covered all the all the questions. And uh, on that note, I have to thank all three speakers for uh, taking the time to, to talk to the community. And uh, and um, uh, thank you. Thank you. And, thank you. Uh, Thank you very much for that. Anything else, the last things to announce in terms of uh, pending activities? Uh, I think Simon mentions a, uh, a uh, public forum later this year. Melroy, from your end, anything that AF has planned? Yes, there are a couple of things. So one thing is we've already started off the community forum, and what we are trying to do is 
try and get more people to start participating in it, asking questions, collaborating with their peers, finding out what other institutions have done, how we can contribute to this discussion in building the community. But another thing that we also are going to start doing is what I mentioned about the collect and connect badges, because we feel that we need to get our consortium members getting these badges. We've got 29 institutions who've already integrated and of them only four or five of them have their collect and connect badges. So the next step is try and get everybody who's done an integration with the collect and connect badges. The only thing that's that's stopping us at this point is uh, there have been some changes to the collect and connect badges with regards to the rules and what needs to be done to demonstrate that you've qualified for them. So yes, once we get a little bit more detail on that, I'll send an email out to all our consortium members, letting them know that we can go ahead and do it. Those, have been, again, so. yeah, those have been finalized and it should actually be easier now to get the first two badges. Yes. Um, yeah, that should be coming out middle of May. Sweet. So yeah, with the exception of that, yeah. Uh, these are some of the main things that we would like to see uh, done in 2018 is the community forum. So get a lot of interaction on that because that is something that the community has strongly asked for. So it's something we would like to see succeed. My understanding is that that Maui uh, AAF is planned to attend ARMS 2018 in Hobart too. Is that right? Yes. Uh, we, we also attended, we've put in a pre-conference uh, workshop for ARMS 2018. And part of that is looking at ORCID in Australia and looking at some of the institutions that have done the integration, how it was before ORCID, how it is after ORCID, what are their plans. And I do believe that we may have NHMRC coming in and talking a bit more about their new research grant management system and how it incorporates ORCID into it. So yes, it would be quite, it will, it will be quite interesting. That sounds great for those who, who come from research office, uh, look out for the uh, AFN's uh, joint workshop with possible presentation from the NHMRC at the ARMS 2018 Hobart conference. Now with that note, I thank all the participants uh, participating today. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thanks, bye.